G'day guys, welcome back to the Mind Mate Podcast. Uh, this is a very special episode because it is my message from the author, which is from my upcoming book, Behind the Curtain, Cultivating Conscious Awareness. This is a book that I have been writing now for about three years, and uh, it has taken on many shapes and forms. It is something that started as a way for me to try to understand myself more because I was moving through what I now know to be an existential crisis, which is something that I hope everyone goes through. We all need some time to reflect. We don't necessarily need to go through a crisis, and I think we can actually mediate the degree to which we suffer based upon how often we practice uh, self-reflection and listen to ourselves and our bodies and listen to the truth, um, you know, be that a meaningful conversation uh, or, or whatever. But we, I don't think we have to go through a crisis, but we do need to, all of us at some point, many points, need to consider uh, the bigger picture, you know, who do we want to be? How do we want to look back on ourselves? You know, what would we like to have done by the time we're 85, 90, if we can live to that age? Uh, you know, what do we want this life to be like for ourselves? Because we have an incredible privilege, all of us that can listen to these podcasts or produce them, in that we are among some of the most uh, privileged people in the world. So we really do have a lot of opportunities and a lot of us can give back, a lot of us can help ourselves in the process and, you know, all these things that we can do. So I really, really, really believe in self-reflection and I have used writing as a way for me to understand myself more. I wrote my first book, writing my second, and hopefully this will be out uh, by the end of the year, December 2020. Uh, it's a hell of a lot bigger and a lot more in depth uh, than my first book. This is a very, very deep book. It's taken me a very long time to just research it, let alone write it. Um, you know, I went, I took a deep dive into evolution, neuropsychology, uh, spiritual texts, mythology. Uh, I did a lot of reading, more reading than I ever did. Uh, you know, when I was at school, and then um, I kind of bought all those books and used them um, as I began to write the chapters. So this book began as a, uh, as I said, um, a look into, you know, trying to understand myself more. So it was initially just a research piece. And then I became really interested in the differences between pleasure and happiness. And it's because I couldn't figure it out, you know, like I was born into a world uh, predicated on the notion that we need to be happy. And I never understood that because I knew intuitively that happiness is just a transient phenomena. You know, I'm happy when I eat an ice cream and then by the time I finish the ice cream, I'm full, you know, or and I don't feel like eating anymore or I feel like a glass of water. So it's this thing that I can never quite grasp eternally, etern for eternity. And I didn't get it. You know, I did not know how to live. I knew that the way I was living wasn't congruent to some form of or aspect of myself. You know, I knew I was just chasing this high all the time to train more, to eat more, to be better, to, you know, whatever it was. But I didn't understand life. And I truly believe that I have figured it out <laughs> now after writing this book. So again, I hope um, this will be ready for you all. Uh, by December of this year, of 2020. The book is about identity. The book is about how identity is actually a construct and that it's malleable and that it is defined implicitly through our actions. So we become, or we are, I should say, what we do, which is actually a quote that's misattributed to uh, Aristotle. Um, he wrote um, a book, I think it was called Nicomedian Ethics, um, and he wrote something along the lines of that. And people often say, Aristotle said, you are what you repeatedly do. Uh, that is not, in fact, the case, but uh, the idea still stands. And it is true. You know, we have all these thoughts. Uh, we have about forty to 60,000 thoughts a day, something like that. Whichever thought we decide to act upon in that moment is the thought that we have valued above all of the others. So above 59,999 other thoughts at that time. And if we continue to act in a certain way based on the thought that we value the most, an identity is born. And thoughts come from, you know, they're kind of like psychological contingency plans. They're these things that manifested evolutionary so that we could peer around the proverbial corner so that we could 
I guess, explore unknown territory without having to physically do so. So you can get a sense of how an identity is constructed based upon traumatic past experiences, social norms, all of these other evolutionary factors. And when I was writing this book and when I was researching it, I started to have a think about who I was and I started to have a think about my own identity. And that really, really scared me because I'd never taken a look at that myself, at, at myself um, to that depth. And I, you know, I had lots of traumatic nightmares. Um, I developed, you know, mild psychosis. Um, you know, this is when Siobhan and I, my partner, were living in Bali. And it was a tough time for the both of us. We were both moving through some serious uh, pain at the time. And some of it we were actually uh, causing to each other. So there was a really tough time. But um, it was, you know, as, as life goes, some of the most meaningful experiences of my life. Anyway, this is the part of the book. This is the very first part of the book. It's from message from the author. I always start my writing... Um, uh, with a message from me to you so that you can kind of get an understanding as to why I wrote the, uh, the piece and um, I hope you enjoy it. So here we go. Message from the author. Mental health has been close to my heart since I turned 21. I had issues. Some I brought on myself. Others arose from the actions of others. Still, they were my issues. Nevertheless, I kissed them goodbye. Then I suffered existentially and came to realize that I must dedicate myself to getting better at doing something, anything. Hopefully, something I enjoyed. I needed to establish, define, and cultivate a life for myself. Then, surely, opportunities would manifest themselves, blossoming from beneath the soil where potential lay. I, now, am ready to embrace the opportunities because I am ready to take responsibility for my life. Now, as an adult, my tool belt full of hammers, nails, and measuring tapes, I am ready to build my house and construct an identity I am proud of. This book is a culmination of ideas I believe might just set the foundation to which I and others may construct an ego, an identity, predicated on humility, integrity, insight, and learning. I hope that, permeating through this ego, humility and curiosity resonate above all else. I was lost for so long. I didn't know how to live, not the least to live with intent. For that reason, and to bypass potential diagnoses like OCD, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder and depression, I want to give people the tools necessary to build a purposeful life. There isn't only one way to live, but there are specific ways, skills and methods human beings use and have used since we came into consciousness to cultivate meaningful lives. Life is impermanent. Our purposes, our actions undertaken to produce desired end goals, change all the time. If we each possess the necessary tools to imbue intrinsic meaning within our lives, we won't wander aimlessly, or at least will remain when we have, excuse me, or at least will realize when we've begun to. That way we can catch our existential anguish before it overwhelms us and produces a depression, a personal grievance of sorts. If we all knew how to frame and reframe our lives, if we knew how to instill meaning from a practical standpoint within them, our sense of identity, self-worth, confidence across time, and acceptance of others, given the acceptance of ourselves, will ameliorate the vast devastation individual and collective nihilism leaves in its wake. My previous and first book, Yes I'm Fine, Just Tired, gave a look into the mind of a human being on high alert. I must confess it feels weird describing myself, although it was in the past, as someone who had an anxiety disorder. That man is nothing but a distant memory, an old identity. My anxiety now functions well. Ah, anxiety, with all its twists and turns. Anxiety with the retrospect gave me a life worth living because it forced me to look inward, perceiving all the shit and gunk I'd neglected for so long. The Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung called this the shadow. Unfortunately, quote, when we never leave that state of chronic emergency, that me first mentality that pervades, all our thinking strengthens and endures, leading us to become self-indulgent, self-serving and self-important. It is important to recognize, just as it was and still is for me, how our thinking makes us feel and act. Anxiety is a selfish, by definition, emotion. That doesn't mean it's a moral, bad or wrong, 
Just note how it might dictate your thinking for future reference. Writing is my meditation, my creative venture, my everything. As a kid, I watched my father write and was inspired beyond belief. I'd never seen anyone work so hard in complete silence. I too fell in love with it, probably because it gave me an outlet to express when talking to others seemed too overwhelming. It would not matter if I were incarcerated so long as I had a pen and paper, an escape. Writing helped me befriend the voice in my head. Better yet, writing helped me connect with my youth, the boy I left behind once external forces proved too influential. Writing was a portal back to the past, back to a time when I could be whatever and whoever I wanted to be. A footballer, astronaut, lion, a man. I could not be a bigger advocate for writing. It helps me express my thoughts, assess my blind spots and make sense of things. It is a creative art of expression and opinion as much as it is a way to help cultivate a greater sense of self. Writing the truth as one currently perceives, being honest, is highly beneficial for a myriad of reasons, some of which are explored in this book. I know writing or storytelling helps others too and has done across the centuries since the dawn of consciousness. Writing your thoughts down hand thinking is a great way to understand yourself, to make sense of yourself. To love yourself, you must firstly begin by attempting to understand yourself. Writing your thoughts down offers a different perspective. It's a tool. It's a ladder to help you see over the backyard fence. You are not your thoughts. You are the observer of your thoughts. Writing them down allows you to observe them. Therefore, observe yourself, the one behind the thoughts. We forget we are the observers and not the thoughts themselves. I fell in love with writing because it helped me. After a panic attack one night, my mum advised me to write about it, so I did. Almost instantly, I felt as though the panic attack was being sucked through the pen, out from my body and onto the page. The thoughts were no longer causing riot in my head. Rather, they formed coherent, structured sentences on the page. That night, I was reminded of my love of writing, because I've always been a writer. I've always tried to make sense of things with a pen or a keyboard. When I was 10, I wrote a 10,000 word essay about a young man named Peter who struggled with depression. His parents died in a house fire when he was young. He was bullied at school, suffered from PTSD, and struggled to find meaning in life. Hi, my name is Peter, I wrote. Peter Reynolds, to be exact. I explained to the reader that Peter had depression. Did I know what that word even meant? I know that the ideas expressed in that pessimistic yet hearty book reappear in this one. I know I've always struggled to find meaning in life, but that's because I never received the how-to memo. So I decided to write the memo myself, albeit a much more complete, in-depth analysis. Peter was my first attempt. Behind the curtain is my second and final one. We as human beings need to feel, to love, and be honest. We need to recognize that the complete human experience is the meaning of life, warts and all. The words on these pages, therefore, are an attempt for me and for all of us to come to terms with everything that holds us back from being ourselves. Most importantly, behind the curtain is an exploration of identity, an exploration towards inner peace. We embody and personify the stories we tell ourselves. These stories, comprised of experience, social norms, value hierarchies and belief systems, structure our perceptions. They structure our lives. In order to change, we need to change the story. We need to understand the story, perceive it objectively, and make adjustments when necessary. If our story isn't serving us, if we are depressed, anxious, lost or stuck, the malleable narrative we live by needs to change. So begs the question, why change? How do we know if we're depressed, anxious, lost, or stuck? Could our lives be any better than they are? What else is out there and within here? In early 2019, I interviewed David G, a meditation teacher originally from New York, who explained to me that, quote, when your cup is full, all you can do is give back. Self-love is attainable, but it starts with a step. More importantly, it begins with a selfish act of kindness. We need to fill our own cups first before we can give back, before we can help others. If you're questioning your narrative, if you think there's more to life and to you, start with yourself. 
You can set an example. People will follow you. The value that sits at the top of my personally constructed hierarchy is the fulfillment of potential. After some time questioning, reading, writing, reflecting, I have found no greater feeling other than attempting to be better every day. Like Sisyphus, the mythological Greek king, pushing that heavy boulder up a hill, life commands us to strive, to be better. We must accept that life is a striving, not an attaining, at least not entirely. The irony of life is that it is the process, the journey that fulfills us most, not the destination. This book is an uncovering of identity, a journey to the journey, a cultivation of conscious awareness. All right, guys, there you go. So that is my message from, well, that is my message to you, I suppose, um, if and when you decide to uh, purchase this book. I'm looking forward to doing the audible version of it too. It's a hell of a lot bigger than my first book um, because I think it needs to be. You know, if you if we're going to dive deep into what identity is, we need to analyze it from multiple le- levels. So I took um, a biological route, I took an evolutionary psychological route, a spiritual route, a pragmatic route, as well as a contemporary route in terms of you know, what uh, today's entrepreneurs and psychologists and things are, are telling us, you know. So I think for this to be a true book and a very real book, the research has to be there. And I need to kind of hit it from all angles to really, really instill that idea that identity, at least my contention anyway, is that identity is malleable. We actually can change. You know, who we are is who we have been. And that idea now is essentially who we want to be and then starting to, you know, begin that journey changes our identity, you know, and I've been doing a lot of stuff on social media lately about this, but the idea that, you know, identity changes all the time, it's malleable and, you know, obviously because life is is impermanent. I am right now a sum total of this of the decisions that I've made. So if I decide to abruptly, you know, um, start dancing in front of the camera, my identity now includes an individual who dances in front of the camera. So identity just doesn't have to be this huge thing. Well, I suppose it is. It is the sum total of tiny little decisions and behaviors and actions that, 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 you know, equate to that identity. So we can change who we are, especially if you don't like who you are, if you want to be someone else, or you think you're capable of more by changing the little actions um, from day to day. So this book is a very, very, very in-depth analysis at essentially what my contention is, which is that you can be whoever you'd like to be. And that's really exciting. So that was a special episode of the podcast, guys. Um, If you liked it and you'd like me to do a little bit more stuff from my books, just let me know. Uh, A lot of you reach out to me on social, which is really cool. Um, I'm very active on social media. My business, MindMate Counseling, uh, is where you'll find all my psychology tips and strategies. My personal one, Tom Dodderhearn, is, uh, you know, just me having fun and um, doing a lot of cross-eyed faces because I just, I just panic and I get too excited. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me know how you think about all this and I'll speak to you next week. Bye for now.